Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm Hello everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. Everybody, welcome to Leet Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for another edition of the show. So uh, we've got another wine here to <clears throat> kind of get me through until I can get the uh, all the recaps of my all my interviews in Germany and then do some, the the uh, Provine uh, uh, coverage. Which, by the way, I'm there. It's press. Um, I actually had to join a or press organization to get legit credentials to go. That's the first time ever. Um, so far, it hasn't leaked yet. I do, I'm ready to go though with a new capsule. Um, <clears throat> I thought there was something else I was talking about that I didn't talk about. Anyway, let's just get into, let's just go ahead and get into the wine. If I remember, I remember. Um, so, uh, 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 oh, I know what it was. So the wine, so last week's wine and this week's wine, um, I chose them using kind of a, using the uh, a random number generator and using uh, and then figuring out what shelf and and slot number on the shelf from my wine cellar <clears throat> that I was just going to pick. Now wine number wine number one last week's wine when I did the random number generator uh, it was going to pick a 1990 Auschwitz uh, Riesling and I really didn't want to review that wine um, because honestly I, I kind of want to use that wine uh, either in a blind tasting or as uh, for, for my blind tasting group or as a bonus wine on days where I don't have to go to work on Monday uh, after tasting group that we can enjoy the wine. Um, I might review it because all my wines are either review wine or uh, tasting tasting group wine or just educational for just tasting uh, in general. So um, but I was like, ah, I don't really want to do the 1990 today. So I picked the rosé that was next to it. Uh, this one, I did totally random. Uh, I actually bought two bottles of this. One's for review and one is for the tasting group. So what do we got here? So we have a classic, very, very classic producer. Uh, this is the 2015, the Irie Vineyards Willamette Valley Pinot Noir. Now this um, winery, uh, they found it in 1965. David Lett planted the first Pinot Noir in Oregon's Willamette Valley. Um, they, they say farming is everything. Expressing the meat, expressing the region means sourcing grapes primarily from their organically certified Dundee Hills estate. Uh, and other carefully managed vineyards uh, contribute as well. In the winery, the wine ferments naturally and ages slowly with 18 months in barrel to clarify uh, without filtration. Um, they do light fining and basically each wine, each vintage that they make, they, they kind of vary what they do. Um, anyway, uh, let's see here. <clears throat> now, when I looked at their stuff, it looked like it wasn't until much later that they produced their first wine. So I think they might have been like farmers first. Like, you know, they, they, they made, I mean, they, they grew the grapes and sold them and then decided to say, screw that. We're going to we're going to start making wine. So I think that's exactly what it. The, the website didn't really kind of <clears throat> didn't really talk about 1965. They talked about uh, whatever whatever year it was. Let me see if I can find that real quick. All right. So far so good. No leaking. Now between this wine and last week's wine, this will be a, a approximately glass number four of the 15 you're supposed to get. Ooh, that's a hard one to get out. Bam, bam, bam. Now, on their website, actually, they tell you just, ooh, why didn't do that? They tell you just to just hold the bottom and lift it up. But I don't like that because you've seen me do that on video. Are you kidding me? It did leak. They're getting an email tonight. All right, sorry. All right, so let's see if I can find this year that they're talking about. Um, oh, it does say 1965. Um, I guess I just missed that. 
when I went here first, I, did, I didn't see this part, so I must have not clicked the link properly. Uh, so anyway, he was, uh, so David Lett was convinced Willamette was uh, uh, potentially perfect for growing Pinot Noir, but uh, exactly where, he had to figure that out. And uh, so in February 1965, he rented a temporary nursery plot near Corvallis and planted 3,000 uh, cuttings uh, he got from UC Davis uh, and selected grows and brought them to, Nor to Oregon. Uh, this was the first planting of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay in, in Willamette and the first New World Pinot Gris. Um, during that year, he went looking for the perfect vineyard site. Uh, he kept looking, looking, looking. Uh, then he, he um, decided, he said, after identifying the right climatic zone, the next challenge was soil. Um, so he checked that out. He figured it out. And then um, they're, they're going through a whole bunch of stuff. Let's see, he sought south or southeast facing site uh, with the proper slope to uh, drain away, uh, sufficient to drain away damaging spring frost. Elevation had to be high enough to access the volcanic soils of the slopes, but low enough for the heat to ripen the grapes. He kept returning to Dundee Hills, blah, 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 in 1966. He finally found what he was looking for, a gentle 20 acre south facing slope at the south end of, of the Dundee Hills. Uh, and that fall, uh, he and his wife, his new wife, Diana, uh, began the process of pulling out the old trees in the derelict orchard and preparing the ground, yada, yada, yada. So they planted it. And then, um, inspired by a pair of red-tailed hawks who made their nest, Irie, uh, in the fir trees at the top of the vineyard site, they decided to call it the Irie vineyard, vineyard. And that was the original planting of their first, of, was the first of their five estate vineyards. So that's where that is. Um, but there's something else about, I thought this is something like the eighties or the, some sort of the seventies that they was their first wine. Anyway, um, they, uh, they basically just, they, they try, they use indigenous yeast. Uh, they let, when they do malolactic fermentation, uh, they let it, um, uh, they let it go indigenous, uh, as much as possible. Actually, I actually think all the time, uh, they, they, they try to be. They try to like listen to the wine effectively and what they're going to do exactly as far as sulfuring and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they do very light fining and they don't do any filtration for what I can see. Uh, oh, by the way, I bought this at Psalm Select for $37 uh, on the website. It says that the um, the uh, suggested retail is thirty-seven fifty, dollars so we're right there. Um, let's see here, uh, blah, blah, blah. So, uh, this particular wine is a blend of 72% estate grown Pinot with 10%, 10 uh, Cottrell Brothers and 8% Thistle Vineyard and 10% Tukwila Vineyard. Uh, and those are also all organic, organically certified or organic, uh, picked by hand. Um, they go to a variety of fermenters from small one-ton bins to a five-ton wooden cuvee to undergo native primary fermentation. Two fermenters were 100% whole cluster and contributed 3.8% of the final blend. A lot of techy, you know, geeky stuff there. The barrels are mostly neutral for the vintage. This one they used 11% new. Um, it doesn't say which whether it's new French or American. Uh, having undergone native malolactic fermentation and aged for almost two years. Uh, the uh, wine was blended after 23 months and then bottled and sealed under what they call a DM cork. Okay. They said that the 2015 vintage was the warmest in Oregon uh, since they started record keeping uh, more than a century ago. Uh, the spring brought early, early blooms and the rare, consistently dry conditions meant that every flower had a better chance than usual to develop into a berry. And then it, they had a cooling trend in September that uh, ensured optimal fruit quality. Um, and they harvested three weeks earlier than normal, but they said everything was on with everything was balanced. 3,691 cases produced. Um, yeah, it was bottled in September, 2017. All right. So let's get into this wine. I'm a little bit concerned because I don't know how much oxygen you guys get in there. So I'll probably, I'll probably sip on this tonight. Um, and then I'll probably drink it over the next couple nights. Uh, Cause I have a few days before I go to Germany. It's kind of why I didn't do sparkling wines. I didn't want to force myself to have to drink the wine quickly. Um, I thought these wines, I would just lay down in the cellar. I get back from Germany. I finish them. All right, let's just check it out. So nose, not a whole lot initially. 
a little bit of red fruit, a touch of red candy. Let's let's get a little swirl here. Got a little funk out of that. Yeah, a touch of funk. A um, little little wet earth, a little mushroom. Some more red fruit. Um. There is a Twizzler. I mean, it's, it's like, it's barely there, but it's not really like super aromatic. Now, I mean, this is warmed up enough after I took it out of the cellar. The cellar sits right at 55-ish, you know, within a degree or two um, on the red side. So, I mean, I've had it out for probably an hour, so it, it's plenty warm. I mean, the bottle still feels cool, so it's probably right borderline serving temperature probably a little warmer yeah aromatically not a whole lot but um nose confirms that they don't use a lot of new wood let's get into the flavors It's definitely, um, I would say a little more non-fruit than fruit on the uh, on the palate there. Um, somewhat brambly, uh, somewhat woody. Um, initially, I didn't really feel like it was a lot of alcohol, but I can I can feel the alcohol a little bit. It's a thirteen six, definitely not high, definitely medium plus on the alcohol scale. Um, but I kind of feel a little bit. I don't feel as much as last week's wine. Um, but it's, you, it, it's there, which is fine. I mean, it's alcohol. There's a slight bitterness to it. Um, the red fruit's more dried. It's also kind of a dried cranberry. Um, I don't really get, I mean, Pinots tend to have a cherry flavor and aroma. I don't really get that. I get more of the cranberry. I get a touch of like spice, but not a whole lot. Um, I get some dried red flowers, uh, some pot yeah, potpourri type of thing, um, a touch of cedar box. Everything's super subtle. It's not a whole lot of anything like just coming out at you. Um, but there's definitely more in the palate than there was in the nose. Um, there's no denying, well, I shouldn't say there's no denying this is not an old world Pinot, but you know, this is definitely a Pinot. Um, if I was blinding it, which I have been given this, not this exact vintage, but I've been given this wine on a blind, uh, and I'm pretty sure I called it Burgundy, and it was, you know, it's not. So it's like one of those wines where I'm kind of like, man, I feel like it could be a Burgundy in a blind, but there should be enough in there to take you to New World. Um, I mean, even I got the funk in there that would tell me French, right? It's a really nice wine. What I like about it is it's it's subtle. It's not an in your face. Even some even for Oregon, it's not in your face. I mean, it's not as bold as some Oregon wines can be. They're still like, they're rooted in, their feet are rooted in both areas, maybe a little bit more in the old world than new world. This is like kind of straddling that and it's just kind of like chill in the background and it's just kind of like, hey man, I'm just here, dude. Enjoy, enjoy it. Don't, you don't have to think about it. This is nothing complicated. I mean, they have some single vineyard stuff, some, you know, higher price stuff. Um, you know, it's a, it's a good just, Good standard Oregon Pinot Noir. Am I blown away by it? Am I blown away by it? No. Do I like it? Yes. Um, considering it's $37, um, it doesn't have to, you know, the more expensive wine doesn't, doesn't mean it has to give you more and more flavor uh, or more complexity necessarily because sometimes wines just are, are just there to enjoy um, regardless of price point. But if those were like 10 bucks cheaper on retail, I'd probably be a little bit happier about it. 
Um, I'm very happy I have it, and it's definitely gonna be a wine I'm bring to. I'm gonna bring to tasting group because I don't think we. I personally don't drink enough of these really elegant, subtle Oregon Pinot Noirs. Um, the, and I don't want to complain about the price point. Um, it's not. It's not a bad price point, but I just don't drink enough of these to kind of be like, oh yeah, all these you know. Oregon Pinots in that $35 to $40 range are around like this, or $35 to $45 is, you know, is about this type of stuff. You know, I've had Oregon Pinots from $10 retail to, you know, $50, $60 retail. So um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it should taste any different. It's great when you get something that's under 20 bucks that's varietally correct. <clears throat> I like it. I like it a lot. But I've had other pinots I liked more. Make sense? Yeah. Now, food? Absolutely. I would say a roasted chicken dish, not just grilled, but <clears throat> a little bit of roasted chicken to kind of, kind of uh, work on the earthy quality, the, the bramble quality of it. Or maybe even a barbecue chicken, like with very little bit of barbecue sauce and a whole lot. Um, you could definitely pair this with a meatier fish, um, you know, like a tuna or a salmon. Um, again, sauce probably plays a lot into what you would pair with this. Um, with fish, I don't eat seafood, but I understand the basics of how you pair seafood in wine or even other beverages. <clears throat> um, a charcuterie, absolutely. Um, I talked about a charcuterie type of thing last week, but um, I would pair this with a little bit harder cheeses, maybe not so much soft cheese, um, and maybe um, a slightly heavier like meat to go with it, like like a like a um, a salami type of thing, or or maybe even a sausage, a, a milder sausage or a lighter sausage, nothing like too too intense. So I think that'd be great. Um, I like the wine, like. I really feel like I should just open it up right now, but my wine key is not over here. Anyway, uh, that's gonna do it for this episode. Um, anyway, that's gonna do it for this episode. Uh, click the links above to friend me up. Up, up there, actually up there. Uh, click the links below to, um, yeah, it's not even four glasses of wine, dude. Um, click the links below to uh, find out more about the wine. And then, um, like, this thing is... Anyway, and then uh, you hit the donate button over there. <clears throat> They're getting an email, like, as soon as I'm done recording this. Anyway, uh, that's going to do, do it. Thank you all for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time.